There's your close-up. It's about as good as it could be done, I believe. I have now got to figure out my next step, and I think it's going to be putting this on the guitar and clamping it down, I think. I'm gonna think that through a little bit because I don't wanna get ahead of myself, but I think that's it. I don't think I can do anything else until I get this locked in place on the guitar. You know, like the bridge plate, I don't think I'm gonna replace it, unfortunately. I wish I could, but I think I will use the bridge itself as a stiffener for when I put in the new bridge plate on top of the old bridge plate. And, and I'm only going to put a real thin veneer over that, just enough to keep the button from going up through the holes, basically is what it amounts to. That really looks pretty good to me. So we'll move on from there. Friends, I got this bridge sitting on here. Um, I'll be honest, it's hard to tell if it's perfect or not because of the odd shape of it and everything. Based on everything I can measure and check and cover up the holes and scars, it's about as good as it gets right where it's at. So I'm gonna go ahead and scratch my mark on it. This is not the easiest thing to do if you've never done this. This can really go south on you if you're not careful. I've done it a lot, so I feel fairly confident marking this, but you're, you can scratch off and really make a big mess if, if you let the exacto knife wander on you. I like to trace it twice on everything I trace to make sure I get it marked well. I can see all the lights of the city. Oh, as far as I can tell, that's marked pretty well. So take it off there, and now it looks really even, too. Actually, I'm surprised how even it looks. I was afraid it'd be off a little bit, but it looks super good, actually. It looks better than I would have anticipated. And now we go through and we painstakingly get rid of all of the finish inside of those marks. You can see there how it's chipping out right up to my little mark. That's what you want. You want it to just be a nice clean line chip out right there. That's why you go over it twice. You can probably see how clean that little section of line is right there. That's how clean it is. That's what I got to do all the way around here. And I'm not going to... Uh, in fact, I'll just show it to you. That's how clean it is right there. And that's the way I got to make it all the way around. And so I'm going to do that all off camera because it's just a lot of scraping and cleaning and scraping and cleaning. So take a good look at it right there. In the next view you see, it should all be cleaned up. Well, there's what she looks like cleaned off. It looks much, much better. Still kind of rough, but not terrible. I'm going to take a tooth blade and just scratch the back of this. Uh, Mainly just, you know, because this, this ebony is such a closed grain wood. I just think it'll stick a little bit better with a little bit of texture. Just, and, and it, it, you know, gets rid of that mirroring uh, slick uh, finish from the sanding. So this just, it's not really digging any deep holes or anything like that. Don't misunderstand. This is just getting rid of the slickness on that surface so that there's some grip to the glue. I'm not trying to make any trenches. And I think that'll work. That gets the surface there, you know, a little bit roughed up. Not, not a lot. But I think I'm ready to go ahead and get this thing glued in. Okay, we're gonna get the glue on here. For one man to love one woman so much it's a pity. From where I stand I can see the cantina she goes. Where she's not supposed to, but goes anyway. I wiggle the brush around a lot to get rid of the air holes because there's always air pockets in these things. And now I'm going to try to use the same amount of glue here, not add any glue so that it doesn't create a bunch of squeeze out. 
try to pick up the glue and use it right here. Because a thin coat is better than a thick coat. And then clamping it really, really well is your ticket to success. And I can hear the music in laughter Our builder tells me that's what her young heart is after And then you wiggle it around till you feel it fall down in that hole and see it's in the hole there so you can't beat that. It's, it just it locks itself in place. That's what's really cool about the way I do that. It doesn't slide around so you can move the whole instrument. And that's, that's really what you want. And trust me, that's not very doable unless you uh, get rid of all that finish and get this thing locked down in the finish. I've got this call made up here and I put some fresh two-way tape on it. I'm hoping it'll kind of stick up there just long enough for me to get the clamp on it. I see you differently, I see you there with the man. Carmilla is lying asleep from where I stand. When you put that call in there, that keeps these clamps a little straighter. You don't have to do that. Um, I've done it both ways, and you can do it without the call, but the call also gives you a little backing which keeps things flatter, so that's nice too. I loosen these up, tightening that up really good and tight. Do not be the guy that's worried about squeezing out all the glue. You're not gonna do that. I don't care how tight you make it, you can't squeeze all that glue out of there. That's just a bunch of baloney that people have made up in their minds. If it was steel and it was met up perfectly, you might be able to squeeze out most of the glue. But on wood like this, with all the fiber and all the different issues, you're not going to squeeze it all out. I don't care how hard you try. I already clamped this middle one down and then tightened these two down. And now I'm putting these in there just to give it that much extra uh, tightness. Yeah, that's squeezing it out there now. You can see it coming out all around there, and that's a good thing. All right, so now I'm gonna off camera just clean up all that glue squeeze out because you don't want that, and you don't want to leave that. Well, I don't think that could have went any better. Uh, you know, sometimes they go good, sometimes they don't go so good. That one went really super well. Uh, yeah, I couldn't ask for anything more than what I got out of that. I think that'll glue up perfectly tight. I don't think it's going to be any further issue at all. I don't think it'll ever break again. We're moving on. I'm going to let this set overnight and we'll move on to the next step. Well, while that bridge is gluing up on that, uh, I thought I'll turn my attention to this pick guard. I've got it upside down, of course, and I'm working on the creeping crud. And trust me, there's a lot. I don't know if it was off and re-glued or if that was done from the factory. It's really hard to say. I can tell you it's not good and it's not flat at all. I mean, it's there's just, you know, like divots in it in places everywhere. But before I try to press it flat, I want to get all of this old glue off as much as I can. All of the old paint, there's like the black paint that came off the guitar on here. I want to get it as close to plastic as I can get it. Then I think what I'm going to try to do is heat it a little bit with a heat gun or something, soften it up, and then put it between two pieces of wood and leave it clamped for a day or so. Maybe even the whole weekend. Then that way, when I get ready to put it back on, and I, I would like to just use two-way tape, then it should hopefully stick better. I'm, I'm hoping. I don't even really know. I, it's going to be difficult to, to do, I think because it's a thick pick guard on top of it, so that makes it even harder. You know, I would say that that looks like real mother of pearl to me. I mean, it really does. It, it looks like real mother of pearl. I'm 99% I'm sure that's what it is. When I get on this side, I don't know what to make of it. It's something different, and, and I don't know what this is. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know if they just have the mother of pearl laminated to a piece of plastic. And then they've got the plastic glued in here. I really don't know what to make of that. 
because it's not mother of pearl on this side. This side here, I don't think that's fake. I'm 99% sure that's mother of pearl. You can see what I'm doing. I'm scraping for all I'm worth, trying to get all the junk off of here. I want to be completely smooth plastic before I try doing anything else to this. So I'll show you what that looks like, hopefully, before I uh, try to straighten it or heat it up or anything. Well, it took a ton of scraping, but I believe I got all of the creeping crud, all the paint, all of the glue, all of the everything that was, you know, not plastic. I'm pretty sure I got, well, you know, you never get it all, but I got 99% of it. Now I'm just gonna take a 220 piece of sandpaper and try to smooth it out. Might even reveal some more stuff that I don't realize is there. Cause I do want this pretty darn smooth before I try to clamp it up and get it flat. And I do think there is more junk there now that I see sanding like this, but I think the sandpaper is actually removing a lot of that final junk, the glue and stuff like that. It does seem like the paper's taking it off of there. That's good. So I think we're going to get down to bare plastic and smooth bare plastic to boot, but I can also still tell you that it's very curled. I'll keep doing this and when I get this part done, I'll show you the next step. That really looks good now. Um, that's the back, of course. Here's the front. Now the front's dirty because it's got static junk stuck to it, but the front's clean. And if you look at that, you can tell that that is real mother of pearl. I mean, it's not the fake toilet seat stuff that people always talk about, mother of toilet seat. It's not that. I can tell you because I can spot that a mile away. But on the other side, they've got it backed with something. Um, so I'm sure that pearl is super thin but I, I'm trying to keep from breaking it by bending it and all that. But that part there seems to be fairly flat. That's the flattest part of the, of the thing, so that's where we're lucky. I think I'm gonna try to lightly heat this all up and soften it with the heat gun, and then I'm gonna just put it between two big flat boards in my uh, big vise over there and let it set all weekend. Here's my heat gun. I'm, it's set, you know, pretty hot. That's gonna hurt after a few minutes here. So I'm gonna try to soften this up. Just doing that, I think it's already flattening out. This kind of plastic probably catches on fire pretty easy. So I, I gotta be careful with it. Keeping it far enough away where I don't think it's gonna get that crazy hot. Now I think I'm just gonna run over there real quick, throw it in between those two boards. They're already in the vise. Well, it's the next day. I've been out cutting firewood and then I thought I better come in here and try to get a little bit more done on this because I need to have it ready for Monday to finish it up. And what I need to do, in, you know, I'm just gonna put another uh, thin bridge pad over this. It'll be very thin. I've been, by trial and error, and trial and error, and trial and error, I finally got this one cut. And it fits up in there really well. When I look in there with, uh, with the, um, glass, uh, you know, the mirror, uh, it really looks like it fits it like a glove. So I'm just going to trace that onto here, onto this piece of Paduk. I'm going to first thin this piece of Paduk down to about, oh, 50, 60,000, somewhere in there so that it'll be thin, but yet strong, won't cre it create any problem on this, you know, and then that way I can glue it to that and fix all the cracks that are in the present bridge plate, plus it'll fix the holes. So there you go. That's what I'm going to do because I don't know any other way to fix this thing without major surgery, and I don't think he wants to get into it that deep. I don't know if it'll be possible to let you see how nice this fits up in there, and I'm not going to get out the inside video camera. There's just too much hassle. But if you can see that mirror, and I don't know if you can, but you can see that it fits it just like a glove. I mean, it fits it exactly the same size and same shape. So, you know, it looks like it was done at the factory, uh, basically, even though we all know different, of course. It, it, that was just sitting up in there with pressure because it just all fits up in there. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna glue it up. I'll just use Type Bond Original here. I'm going to use my high dollar glue spreader since it's probably the best one I got. 
This is not a super thick coat, but it's not a thin coat either. It's kind of a medium coat. I really want to get a good amount of glue on there so that it'll make good contact. It's up in there just fine. I can use this call as a backer. It fits up in there fine too. This was the big call I used when I clamped the bridge. Yeah, I don't think I really need that. I'm gonna just use just the plywood. It fits up in there fine. And then I'll just do it this way again. The only problem is I have to keep my hand in there this time to keep it up in there because I don't have the double stick tape on it. But that should be all right. Just snug those up again. Tighten that down really good. Put these back on here again. That should make the bridge plate go up real flat and tight. And now I'll just double check it by eye here. It's hard to see up in there obviously, but I can still see. Yeah, that looks perfect. So that should work just fine. All right, I'm gonna let that set. Uh, it's Saturday, so I'll let that sit till probably Monday. And then we'll do the intonation and the final setup on this thing. I was thing. gonna call it quits on this for the for today, but then I got to thinking, um, you know, I wanna redo this, where this bare wood is showing now, because apparently they glued it with some kind of weird glue that just melted the paint or something. and. I don't think that was done from the factory. I think that was done later. But anyway, um, I'm going to try to touch up these spots and make them black because they're going to look funny under the pick guard. The pick guard's clear now, or, you know, semi clear. And I want it all one color. Well, I don't actually have any obvious black enamel paint that would work. So I think what I'm going to do is just take some of this uh, brushing lacquer and I'm going to just make up a you know, a couple uh, puddles here. I think just a couple thimbles full will probably be enough. I'll just go ahead and do three just to play it safe, but I'm pretty sure I'll have more than then enough. Then what I'll do is I'll just put in some black leather dye and stir that up and it'll, I think it'll be black enough for our purposes. In fact, I'll probably just use the same eyedropper here clean it off on the end and just suck up some black dye and pour it in there. It'll be more than enough, I'm sure. Stir that up really good and you can see that it makes a really nice black paint. It's lacquer so it, it'd be good for the sound anyway. It won't hurt the sound any. I'm just gonna blob it on here in all the rough places wherever it's really rough and uh, including the white. Wherever it's still smooth, I'm just gonna leave that like it is. Actually, now that I plan to do it this way, I probably do need every bit of this because it's a pretty big area. I wanna be able to smooth this off, uh, sand it a little bit, get it um, one smooth thing so that the uh, two-way tape will stick the pick guard back on here. At least that's the hope. I don't know that this will work, guys. I'm just, you don't know on all these things. You just give them a shot sometimes and see if it's going to work. A, a, I guess you could call this yet another good tip just on for the black if you <laughs> need to touch up a black painted instrument if you you know get you some of that brushing lacquer and mix in some of this black leather dye um, you know it's probably very similar uh, to what your original paint would have been. Even if the original was enamel versus lacquer, this I don't think would be a problem to use over the enamel anyway. I'm going to put it on pretty thick where the bare wood is, where I can see the bare wood showing through. Or the fibers, I guess I'd say. It's, I don't actually see the wood anymore, but I can see the fibers. There are some scratched up places on this instrument the customer kind of wanted me to touch up anyway. And one of them is right under here. I don't think you can see it very well. 
but it's right in here and it's a pretty big scratched up white spot. I'm going to go to a finer brush and try to just touch that spot up as best I can. I wish I would have done it before I put all this paint on here, but I didn't think about it. Looks better than that. And here's a spot too that's dented. Um, I can't guarantee this is going to fix this, but it, I don't think it'll hurt its looks any because it's it looks kind of bad anyway, so if I just paint this on here very nicely, just in the dent, I think it'll make it look better. A few more little scratches and dings there too that probably won't hurt to just go ahead and touch them either. I don't honestly know if this is going to be successful or not. Just going to let it sit like that. I, I would show it to you better, but unfortunately it's, you know, it's all wet and I don't want it to run. But not, Hopefully you can see it there. I can't tell what you can see in the camera very well right at the moment here because of the weird backlighting for me. It's Monday morning. I'm back on this thing. No stress. All I have to do is have it finished today. I am just wiping down the instrument now with some warm water. And because the shop's so cold, this water's not very warm almost instantly. <laughs> in other words, it's warm while it's in there, but when I put it on here, it turns cold pretty fast. You can see just the creeping crud coming off of there. Yeah, it's good to just take uh, just light amount of water. You don't, you don't soak your rag down, by the way. And you just rub it really good and try to get all the junk off of here. Probably off camera. I think I'm almost certain it was off camera. I added a second coat of paint to this and it's lacquer with some black dye is what it amounts to. So it's not exactly paint. Uh, paint would be, you know, probably not the best choice for your acoustics. But the lacquer is one of your better finishes acoustically. That's why I chose to do it that way. Just dye the lacquer. There's lots of little, I don't know if they'll show in the can, but you can see all the little spots on it. It'd be nice if all that was gone. I'm pretty sure all that's just sweat spots from over the years of being played. That's what it looks like. I'm going to take it over to the buffer while I've got it in this shape and see if we can get rid of some of that. I don't know if it'll come off or not. Well, I tried the buffing wheel and if I worked on it for a long time, it might actually do it, but it doesn't seem to be taking it off very quickly. So I thought what I'd try is the semi-chrome and see if it does a better job. You know, because it's so much more concentrated and in a small space, I kind of think it might get rid of it. Just try this little area right here and see what that looks like. Dampening down the, the uh, pad, the uh, cloth again here, this paper towel, and going back over it with water first. As luck would have it, I'm out of towels, so that was my last one, so I gotta go get some more. People ask all the time which brand I use. I think we just get these at Walmart, but that's the brand I prefer. And these are the non-quilted. So there you go. Just show it to you, the whole label there. There you go. That's what I buy. Uh, they, these work great for finishes. I really like them. Here's what they look like out of the packaging. You can see there, there's no quilting in these. Very soft, very good towels. Well, that's actually getting rid of a lot of those spots. So I think I'm gonna do a lot more of that. I'm gonna do most of that off camera and I'll show you what it looks like when I'm done. Thought I better mention in case you find yourself in a similar situation, I'm not getting this polish uh, you know, the semi-chrome polish. I'm not getting it where I'm going to eventually glue down the pick guard. I'm trying to keep it off of there, but I am getting it pretty much everywhere else that we could clean this finish up. Black is a hard finish to uh, make look good. I mean, it looks great when it's brand new. Uh, that's about the best I can say about it. It's difficult at best to make black look good after it's brand new. 
tear, I'm tearing off several paper towels here and, and going because there's some glue on that first couple there and I'm getting a clean getting down to the clean towels since I'm trying to buff this out and I don't want that glue to scratch anything. That would give you some idea that got rid of most of the spots. It's this is not a hundred percent cure-all either, but it works pretty well. Uh, if you worked at it long enough, you could make it perfect. But, uh, you know, I don't want to spend the customer's money for the most minute detail and just work for hours here. I'm trying to do this as fast as I can and get a decent result versus a perfect result. The customer can see what I'm doing here in the video and he can always choose to do more of it. Just on and then right back off. And, and you, on the on, you really do rub it kind of hard, you know, and, and even on the off, you, you have to rub it pretty good to get a decent uh, buffing effect. It's looking pretty good, but I'll finish the rest of it off camera. Well, I think you can tell that looks a lot nicer. It's not perfect. But much better, you know, it's it's that old thing I always say, it looks like it's been well cared for now versus, you know, just kind of, you know, used and thrown in the corner type look. This is uh, at least starting to come back now where it looks pretty decent. Once we get the pick guard on it, get it all set up, it's going to look pretty good. I will uh, say two more things. The semi-chrome polish is what I just used. It's a metal polish. I was turned on to this by my buddy Randy Shardiger, a YouTube friend. And uh, Randy, uh, I think he knows that that's where I got this from, uh, this idea. Never thought about using a metal polish on guitar finishes, but it works really, really good. It's got just enough abrasive to get that deeper shine out of it. I will tell you before you start though, before you start this, you got to realize it's an elbow grease uh, intense experience. In other words, it doesn't just go on and come off and everything's hunky dory. You got to rub and you got to rub and you got to rub. But when you do that and you really put your effort into it, it does uh, yield very nice results. So thank you, Randy. Check out Randy Shardiger's channel whenever you get a chance. I'm about ready to start the process of bringing this thing back to life. I think before I do that though, I think I'm gonna sand this pick guard area. It's rough as a cob right now. You can probably hear it. Like, that's what that sounds like. Here's, here's what it sounds like here. You can just tell there's a huge difference. Nothing, there's nothing here. This is rough as it can be. And that's from, you know, melting all that finish and it's sticking to the back of the plastic and, you know, and all I did was fill it in with uh, painted lacquer to try to uh, at least give me one coherent surface. I'm going to get, um, well, I'm going to start with 220. I'm afraid I'm going to sand through right away, which is not what I want, but you got to do something, you know, like here's a, a big bump right there. That's got to go away. Got to get rid of the, the bumps and the ridges and the roughness. And I'm going to try to keep my 220 just where the pick guard goes. If I could, I would have started with 400, but this is so rough that it would take me forever to get the 400 to knock this down. So that's why I'm using the 220. I may go to 400, depending on what this looks like when I'm done. I'm trying to stay within the boundaries and try not to get outside the boundaries. It's difficult to do because you do need to get all the way to the boundary because the boundary is what will hold those edges up. And if you're holding the edge up, it's going to come loose. It's another one of those kind of deals where I have to remind people, I think, that, you know, I didn't create this problem. I'm trying to fix the problem. I mean, seriously, this is rough, boy. I mean, it's really, really rough. It might be if I sand through it, I'll have to uh, put some more lacquer on it. Again, this is another one of those elbow grease intense operations. You. This may look like it would be simple and easy, but 
you got to apply quite a bit of force here and you got to get these things fairly level or it's not going to glue down very well. And these little points are probably the worst. More than likely if you've had a guitar like this you know that the points come up first. If you don't get them smooth in those areas good luck with using the two-way tape and getting it to stick because it probably won't happen. All right I'm going to wipe it off here with a towel and see where we're at. You know it's still rough but by comparison but way smoother than it was I mean like before it was worse than sandpaper I honestly think I'm gonna have to go with another piece of 220 fresh piece and see if I can smooth it out some more because it's it's not real good yet I'm trying to hit mostly the high spots where you can feel that it's higher and I'm trying to at least at least blend the high spots down to the lower spots so that it's not like a step. That's the only chance we got to make this stick. And even that, I gotta be honest, it's a slim chance. Uh, you know, if this really works, it's, you know, pretty much a miracle. way better this time than even after the first time. Okay, where it's tied up against this fretboard, I'm going to use this little sanding thing to get up in there because it's really rough right in there and it's not going to stick. This little thing on these points to help me a little bit. I'm certain that's way better than it was. As you can see now that I'm starting to sand through. And I'm going to go get the uh, pick guard out of the press. I know it's already pretty flat because I repressed it once over the weekend. I took it back out of the press, heated up again, put it back in there. It had improved uh, after the first pressing by a lot, but it looked like it was trying to spring back. So I heated it again, put it back in there. I'm hoping now, after setting another 24 hours, it will be, you know, back to its original shape and stay there. But I got to be honest, I kind of doubt that it'll stay there. I mean, you know, these things, they move, their shape moves over time and they don't like to go back to their original shape. They just don't. And it doesn't matter whether it's wood or plastic or whatever you're talking about. Anyway, I'll go get that. Well, there you can see it. And right now it's as pretty much flat as a pancake. Compared to where that thing was, that's saying a lot. It's, it's way flatter than it was. And there's where it goes right there. And yes, you can see some of my outside sanding there, but that could be buff with the polish and get rid of most of that. That looks pretty darn good. I tell you what, I'm tempted to just go ahead and try it. I'm wondering if I shouldn't wipe it down with alcohol first or something like that. I'm a little bit afraid to try it. Here's some isopropyl alcohol. I'm thinking if I wipe it down with the alcohol that it will uh, get rid of any of that light dust. And the alcohol doesn't leave much residue. It ain't great, but it's a hundred times better than it was. And that's still bad, <laughs> unfortunately, because it was really bad before. I don't think it's going to have much trouble sticking here, but I'm going to go ahead and even wipe this down with the alcohol too. And ordinarily, I don't like putting chemicals on plastic at all, but I think the alcohol is 
relatively benign compared to most chemicals you put on your plastic. It re did remove a little bit of color and stuff there, so that's good. Maybe this will give it its best chance for sticking. The way I do this is I just put it on in straight lines like that. Cut it off, try to cover this as well as I can, rub it in really, really good. Put on another layer here, and I try to get it as close as I possibly can to the first one. Cut that one off, so, and then this piece here I'll put on like so. I'll show you the next step. Okay, I've rubbed it and rubbed it, so I think the plat the tape is sticking to the plastic as good as it can be stuck. Just cutting this off now, and you should be able to just lift this up and peel it right off. The music plays on as I watch the tender embracing. From where I stand, I can see her dress as it swaying. It seems to be waving goodbye to me. Inspect that really good. I think it's really good. There's a little teeny piece of stuff right there. Okay, so I'll show you the next step. Well, this is the one I'm worried about. I'll be honest. I, I, I got my doubts that this is going to stick. I mean, I really do have my doubts. You can only do what you can do, you know. I got no miracles in my pocket. It would be nice if it would just find a miraculous way to work, but I kind of doubt that's going to happen. I'm trying to get it as close to the original place as possible. That looks like it to me. You know, it, it feels like it's stuck. Um, it really did. It felt like it went down really well. But I got my doubts. By using the two-way tape, the good thing is, if it comes loose and comes off, no big deal. You just do it again or try something else. But, but if you use glue, you just kind of get one shot at it and you got a mess after you're done. With the two-way tape, if it comes off, it comes off and not much of a problem, you know. At least it didn't create any additional problem that you would have had had you did the glue option. Feels like it's stuck pretty darn well. Well, let's move on. We got a long way to go and a short time to get there. The customer had asked that I touch this up. Now, I did paint that originally, but apparently the uh, semi-chrome got on there and kind of scuffed it up a little, so I'm going to try painting it again. I tried getting all the semi-chrome off of it. I stand, I can hear the music and laughter. Carmilla tells me that's what her young heart is after. I'm going to leave it like that on that part. Here's another one right over here. I'm going to try touching up a little bit. I was going to paint this white little thing, but I think it's actually glue now that I look at it. And I'm going to see if I can get the glue off of there rather than paint it. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a super delicate operation without scratching something. Not sure I can do it. I see you differently, I see you there with a the man Carmilla is lying to see from where I stand Carmilla is lying, I see it from where I stand Alright, I'm going to leave it at that for now. I may touch up some more of this later. I've got uh, the string, two strings on this. You can see my little rig. It's just coat hanger wire hooked up here and soldered up that makes it work. And this way I can set the intonation. I, I've got just two strings on it. I just take my tuner. Maybe you can see the tuner too. I don't know. I'll try to zoom in a little bit here where you can maybe see the needle on the tuner.
I only have this little string up to an E, e flat. And I know that's not where it should be, but. You can see it's um, sharp. That means this, the saddle distance is too short that way. So we pull it back a little bit and we'll try it again. Still sharp. Well, that's crazy. I didn't think it was that sharp. We're a little better. Still sharp though. That's pretty good right there. Now we'll get the e, the bass E. I'm going to pull it back just a hair. It looks really good. That's pretty darn close. I'm going to mark that. What I use is just a real sharp uh, pencil. And this is a 0.05 uh, or a 0.5, I guess, millimeter lead. I want to mark the front edge because that's the last place the saddle is touching and that's where I want to make sure that we do this well. In other words, I want the front edge of the new saddle I build, regardless how wide it is, if it's, if it's narrow like this or if it's this wide, I want the front edge right there because that's the last place the string touches, is right on the front edge. You'll see a lot of saddles made where, they're, where they touch in the middle and things like that and that works okay. Uh, as long as everything's done correctly. But uh, I do it this way and, and make it touch on the last place it leaves the saddle. It's very accurate by doing it this way. If you find out that you're still sharp, then you've got all of the thickness of the saddle to file backwards. In other words, like say you, you get here now you say it's, it's sharp, I can, I can file away the front edge of this and it move the string to the, toward the back of the saddle. So that's kind of why I do what I do. We're going to go ahead now and uh, set up the rig to route the slot. Well, it's 10 o'clock. The customer just called, said he's coming here about 11. So that means I've got an hour to finish this. <laughs> Not really, I don't guess, but I'm going to get it, try to get it done in that hour, and I think I can. But, you know, I'm wanting to route this slot, and uh, I may have shown you in a previous video. I don't know if you've seen that yet. The fellow that made this thing, he was big on those... Um, thread inserts, what do you call them, helicore? Well, those things just have never worked for me and they didn't work on this. They, uh, I was screwing that, that little thumb screw he made in and out and you can see the helicore wrapped itself around that and won't come and it came out of the hole and bottom line is I gotta fix it. So I'm gonna just re-thread it. I've got an M6 uh, uh, by one, uh, it's M6 one millimeter, I think that's what that means. And I'm gonna try tapping it with that. I don't wanna drill the hole out. I found this screw that fits it and I can at least use the screw temporarily before I, and later I can make a better handle or something. But right now, I just wanna get the job done. And like I said, I don't have a lot of time. The little handle for this has left and it was right here. Anyway, I'm gonna just try tightening recutting these threads here. I don't know if it's going to work and of course the tap wrench is not working. You know, probably the first time you've ever seen anybody cut threads with a pair of pliers, but I'm sure it's not my first time. I tried to find a bolt that would fit the helicore threads that were inside there and I couldn't find anything that would fit it. I went through a whole bunch of bolts and things in the shop and nothing seemed to be correct so that's why I just decided to recut them 
and it will work as well as it works, however well that is. All right, so let's see if we can unscrew this now and see if we can get our screw to go in. So this sh theoretically should screw in there now. And it does. All right, so now I just have to figure out how to set this thing. This depth stop is very handy for this. That's why I wanted that fixed. So let's get this all back up in here in position where we can attempt to do this. Like I said, no pressure. The customer will be here in about 50 minutes. So the first thing I do is I set it down close, tighten it up, and then I work it back and forth and see if I'm on my line. Right at the moment, I'm about centered on the line and I wanna be behind the line so that I'm cutting right behind it. So I can adjust these, pull it back a little bit. I like to look at it two or three times. You only get one shot at this. I like to turn the bit like this too to make sure the bit is, is at its widest point when I set this. That looks really good right there. So I've got it locked down. All right, so now I'm gonna go ahead and push this thing all the way down to the surface and lock it in place. And now with my depth stop, I can, this depth stop here, I can put something in here the right thickness and then I can drop it down that additional thickness and that'll cut my slot that deep. Now, wh how much is that thickness? I don't know. I'm gonna start out fairly small anyway. So I'll probably start out at about 50 thousandths and go from there. I don't know if I've got anything here that's 50 thousandths or not, but usually these saddles are a good thing to use for things like that. And here's a, here's a thin one. And I'll check the thickness on it. The thickness on that is 60 thousandths, so that's pretty darn perfect. The way I do this, the way it was designed is you can lay this in here, you can drop your depth stop down to it, tighten your depth stop down, and I'll even use a screwdriver just to, since that's what this is, to, I don't have a grip on it, and I'll just tighten it a little bit. So now I can take this piece of shim out of here, this saddle, and then I can just drop, open this up and drop this down that thickness of that saddle. Tighten it back up and we should be off to the races. That looks really good right there, so I'm gonna go with that. Okay, I think we're about ready to start this. Now, before I do though, I just remembered one more thing and I, I wanna put a stop on each end and I'm just gonna do it by eye. I'm gonna stop about there and I'm gonna stop about here. That's just gonna be my eye because that's, you know, these things are not square and nothing lines up, so you just gotta just do some things by eye, and there you go. Can you see what I'm doing even? All right, well, here we go. Uh, it'll either be great or I'll be crying. Actually, I, I got to thinking about it, and um, I don't wanna do it this way. I wanna, I wanna, use the plunge the way it's designed to be used and uh, set this down on here flat and then plunge into it, I think. Uh, uh, I think that's what I wanna do. It's, it's difficult to be this exact. See, the, it's not like a regular router. You can be off a teeny tiny bit somewhere, but this is so exact, you can't be off. You have gotta be exactly right. And even, even as well as this is made, it still has a little bit of play in it. So I've got to be very careful about plunging this, but I'm going to try it. All right, so I'm going to just go down another 60 thousandths. So I'll use that same shim. You should be able to sit it back down in there just like that and then go ahead and plunge it the rest of the way. That looks pretty good. Uh, we should be a reasonable depth, but I think I want to go deeper. We're at 143 thousandths according to that. 141 and 48. So 
Apparently it's getting a little deeper on this end here. We've got 300,000 to go, so I'm gonna go ahead and do it again. Same, same technique. All right, we'll try this one more time and hopefully we won't screw it up. That's 210 thousandths. So we're two thirds of the way through and I think that's plenty good. So we'll move on to making the saddle now. Well, assuming I had the camera on, you saw me route the slot for this and I have just off camera made a new piece of bone saddle here, antler saddle. It seems to fit it like a glove. I'm going to draw a little line on it right now and just to make sure that it's going down its full depth there. Looks pretty good. It honestly looks like it could be sitting on some sort of a little tiny shelf here on this side. So I'm gonna check that out real quick here. I kinda think it's right on the very end. I think that's what it is. Let's see if that fix that. All the way down, draw another fine line and see if it went in deeper. It went in a little bit deeper. I'm thinking that looks pretty good. It's probably all the way down. That looks pretty good to me. I think we're done on that. So now we just need to profile it a little bit. And my profiling will just be done by eye and experience that I've done. So I'm just going to take it over there to my sander and profile that a little bit. I've got the saddle in there and almost ready to string it up. We've got to re-drill these holes now and re-ream them. And remember we've got a piece of uh, padauk on the inside and we have to drill through that as well. What I'm going to do to drill through that is I'm going to put a little call in there and then that way that should keep it from breaking through or breaking out the wood on the inside. All right, I've got a call on the inside to help uh, back this up when I drill through. I'm gonna look up in there just to see if we did have much tear out. I kind of think it's okay, but you never know. No, it's perfectly smooth. I, when I first looked at it, I thought, uh-oh, we got a problem. But no, it's, it's real smooth, perfectly smooth. And now I've got to uh, ream out these holes just a little bit. And um, the first thing I'm gonna do is do a little bit of a countersink on that. I'll show you how I do that. You can see I use a step drill. They don't tear out like other uh, things do, They're, or chatter. That's the problem with regular countersinks. They either tear out or they chatter. And now I've got the whole kind of tapered a little bit already, and now I can run this down through there until I feel it. And then that tapers them to the perfect size of the pegs. And if you don't think this thing's cutting, just watch the wood that comes out with it every time. You know, it, it definitely cuts. It's pretty sharp. That typically makes it the perfect size for your bridge pin. Of course, not all bridge pins are made exactly the same. So now we'll test to see if these are okay. Gonna be fine. Okay. Now I'm gonna clean out the inside of this thing before I string it up. I just, I did the, uh, countersink I just touched it on the top of there too just to just to widen out just a little bit more but only very lightly because those kinds of countersinks like to chatter really bad I think we're ready the only thing I'm going to do before I string it up is I'm going to oil down this uh, piece of wood here because it's it's just a dry piece of ebony it's never had any kind of treatment using the be good oil it's a mixture of, I don't know, some sort of a food safe type of oil with uh, beeswax. It's a pretty good thing for bare wood. And you just wipe it back off. I just noticed something that I haven't noticed before and I don't know 
there's a line around here that parallels the shape of the bridge and it's out about a quarter inch from the original bridge. Now I, you know, I know that my bridge is just a hair bigger than the original that came off of here, so I can't imagine what that line is for. It must have been something in the factory. It's, uh, it's really weird. Can you see that? Now that it's all cleaned up, you can see that kind of stuff. I want to work on these tuning keys. There's, they're not smooth, and there's tons of creeping crud on them. So I'm going to try to oil them and clean them a little bit. Off camera I tapered all the pegs off here and that's to keep the button from grabbing a hold of the end of the peg. And that lets them slide on past much better. And once I slide it past I always pull up on the string like that to make sure the ball is seated really well. I'll get the strings on here and I'll show you the next step. Okay, I have all the strings on here and it's just tuned up to pitch and the action is absolutely crazy high. I knew it would be. I've got this saddle too tall, but I thought I could start with that and see about it. Um, yeah, we're going to take off quite a bit. It's probably even too tall to really measure it well. That was just a guess where I said it because I had no idea. We'll knock off a bunch of this and then redo this. I'm not going to lie to you, that was set up way too high, so I'm going to knock off quite a bit here. In other words, it was more than 150 thousandths, just the way it was. So we're going to knock it down by that 50 thousandths for sure. So that means I have to take 100 thousandths off of this saddle, which seems crazy because I don't think I've ever had to do that before. But I'm, I'm actually even going to take a little more off. Just I'm going to take off about 105 thousandths because I know we're going to need quite a bit here and I just mark it in the black. So now I have a mark in those two black spots and I can just sand it off up to that spot. Okay, we've cut that way down. It's still going to be high, I already know that, but we just, you know, you gotta start somewhere. Okay, we're still at, uh, I'm gonna say 135 thousandths. So I'm gonna write that down. And on the treble side, we are, a little better, but not much. About 125. Okay, and I want to get this down to 90 and 80. And so that's 45 on that side uh, difference. And um, well, 45 on the other side too. So both of them are about 45 thousandths uh, too high here. And uh, so that means I got to take another 90 thousandths off that bridge. Now that seems like an excessive amount. I'm going to double check my math to make sure I didn't screw something up here. Well, my friends, um, got to have to back up and punt here a little bit. I, you know, I cut this saddle way down to where it's supposed to be, and, and that should make this thing play fine. But I also know that this is going to make it very deep in this uh, slot. Now, don't think I screwed this up because I didn't. What I did do is I left this the same thickness as the thickest part of the bridge, of the previous bridge. In other words, I didn't taper it down. The old one was tapered from the base down. I'm going to just take this whole thing flat down. Um, oh, maybe 40 thousandths or something. I don't know. I'm, I'm just going to start here and uh, knock it down some. This was my intention from the start, is if I needed to take it down, it's, it's always better to take wood off than it is to try to add wood back. Now that I've trimmed all that off, I can set this in there and see if it looks like it's still going in too deep and it is a little bit too deep still I think so I'm just gonna take it down some more I'm also kind of doming it a little bit the original was tapered, just flat tapered. 
and I thought that looked awfully weird and so I'm going to dome this one just a little bit which is the, which is more the norm for a bridge it still might be a little bit deep but I think it's probably doable it is doable right there the bridge is still fairly thick and there's no harm in cutting a little more away so I'm going to go ahead and cut a little more away I'm mostly cutting it away on the ends again because I'm trying to dome it just a little bit and for the two skeptics out there I'll just show you that uh, the saddle slot is still real deep there's it's set on zero and the saddle slot is still 170 thousandths that's a lot so it's no problem at all I think I'm gonna go with that right there that looks pretty good to me I'm going to sand this off of course I think this is some 400 I may have to go to 220 first Still needs a little bit more work. I'm going to go down to the 220 even though I'm almost there with the 400. It'll just make it go faster. That's looking pretty good. Still a little bit I can see. Okay, I think that solves that issue. Now we're going to uh, cut the uh, chamfer on here again, the countersink. Now all you gotta do is find the saddle that I probably could have lost there, but I found it. And that looks perfect. So now I will uh, oil this back again and then we'll hopefully string it up I don't know if it'll be for the last time but it'll be hope at least if it's not last it'll be second to last I think and we're getting really close that's looking pretty fine let's string it up again and see if we're in the ballpark I think we ought to be right on the money now the only thing that might need to happen now is I might need to cut a little bit of grooves here between the holes and the saddle, possibly, possibly. The groove in this pin doesn't go up high enough either, so I'm going to make that groove a little bigger with the Dremel. And hopefully to save some time, I'm just going to use the same bit I used for the routing. I knew that would be sketchy, but I got it done. It just is barely fitting there, but it's fitting. Well, I just checked the action. We got it right at 90 and 80. It seems to play really good, uh, so let's play it. Well, I'm real pleased with it. It turned out really nice. Here's what she looks like up close. You can't hardly beat that considering where we started. It was pretty rough. And, uh, you know, the tuning keys have loosened up a little bit. I did oil them. I did wipe them down with alcohol mostly. Mostly just to kill the creeping crud that was on them. They just felt real grody-like. <laughs> anyway... Seems like it's gonna be good, fine now. From where I stand, I can see all the lights of the city. For one man to love one woman so much, it's a 
pity From where I stand I can see the cantina she goes to Where she's not supposed to But goes anywhere It's a real good sounding guitar. Those three things we did to it sure didn't hurt the sound. That solid ebony bridge versus that inserted piece of junk they had on there. The uh, capping with the uh, paduk over that uh, broken maple bridge uh, will strengthen that and keep the crack from reoccurring and also get rid of all those holes that were wallowed out where the uh, string was pulling up through. So that fixed that. And then the deer antler saddle, of course. So, and then of course, just polishing it up a little bit and cleaning it up a little bit, uh, sure didn't hurt anything. I did not do an actual fret job on this guitar. Looking down at it, it looked fine. Playing it, I don't hear any buzzes. I don't see any reason to spend the customer's money. So I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you so much for watching. If you're not yet a subscriber, please do that. What are you waiting on? And also a thumbs up would sure be most welcome. Thank you. Yeah, yeah.